uh, this morning to our panel on uh, the next billion digital natives. And uh, I'm Ron Diebert. I'm the director of the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to pass the mic along the panel for ha to have each panelist introduce themselves. I'll say some remarks. We're going to show a short video and I'll explain about the video. Then we're going to have a dialogue, so there are no set presentations here. Instead, it's a, a, a question and answer dialogue uh, involving not only the panelists, but we hope as many of you as possible. And then we will show a video at the very end as well, uh, which I'll also explain about at the time. So uh, pass this down to Fet. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fet Seo. I'm a senior program officer with the uh, with Canada's International Development Research Centre at the Crown Corporation of Canada, uh, based out of New Delhi. Um, hi, my name is Jack. I'm with the Association for Progressive Communications. I work on the Women's Rights Program, and I'm from Malaysia. Good morning. My name is Hanan Bujemi. I am the project manager of the Internet Governance MENA program with Hibos, and I'm based in The Hague. I'm Malid al Zakat, director of Master of Global Journalism at Arab University, researching new media and censorship online, and I'm from Yemen. Thank you all. Um, and helping us is Jenny for our, from our group, and Robert will be uh, carrying a mic around, acting as a facilitator of the conversation once we get started. So as I said, the first thing we're going to do is show a short uh, video trailer. Uh, this uh, video is a, um, uh, we did this as a, uh, a kind of overview of an event that we have held for the last three years at the University of Toronto called Cyber Dialogue. And I want to tell you a bit about how that process started. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, the Citizen Lab is a research uh, institute at the University of Toronto. Um, we're independent of governments and corporations. We do research on internet censorship, surveillance, information controls broadly from a human rights perspective using a mixed methods approach. Uh, in 2009, we had a report come out that kind of put us in the middle of a, uh, a minor global media storm at the time. This was a report called Tracking GhostNet about cyber espionage. And that report started with um, uh, research that we were doing in, in Dharamsala, India with Tibetan groups who suspected that their computers were being monitored. And so we have a very capable technical forensics team that went to Dharamsala and gathered evidence that we then an analyzed in the lab. And we found out because of mistakes made on the, on the part of the attackers who were trying to infiltrate the Tibetan computers, that not only had they infiltrated the Dalai Lama's office and the Tibetan government exile, but they'd also managed to infiltrate hundreds of government ministries, foreign affairs departments, the Indian embassy in Washington, D.C., and so on. So we wrote up this report, the GhostNet report, and it was covered widely in the media at the time. And it brought us into contact with uh, a, a community that we, uh, certainly speaking for myself, I, I knew a lot about as a scholar of international relations and international security, but we hadn't had much contact with directly as a research group, and that's the intelligence defense community, especially in uh, the United States. Uh, they saw the GhostNet report as something very important, and so we were invited down to Washington, D.C., to Pentagon events and so on, you know, to audiences that uh, normally people from a human rights background don't have much uh, conversation with. And at that time, it dawned on me that there was a problem uh, emerging at a global level, uh, that very quickly this domain that we all use for communications, for as our public sphere, sometimes for our most intimate conversations on a daily basis, was quickly becoming uh, ground zero for the armed forces of the world and intelligence agencies. And I could foresee that as it is becoming securitized, uh, there are going to be problems for some of the things we take for granted or assume are characteristics of the internet and cyberspace. Um, meanwhile, I began to understand from the perspective of those communities that they had real issues to deal with. Um, there are, uh, first of all, there's a vast underworld of cybercrime that, in fact, was uh, the basis upon which 
the uh, Chinese-based attackers were using techniques from to infiltrate the Tibetans. And so this is a big problem that law enforcement has to deal with. Um, and of course, there are um, many national security issues. And I realize that civil society um, sometimes has a uh, reflexive tendency to dismiss uh, or not want to be a part of those conversations. Those are the conversations that take place uh, but it, among the, the men and women in uniform. And I thought, this is a problem. We need to uh, at least have a, a forum where we bring together these different stakeholders. And so we started that forum at the University of Toronto called Cyber Dialogue. Um, we've had three now. It's by invitation only, um, capped at 100. And it's the one event, one event, I think, in this space that brings together equal representation of civil society, private sector, and government, including defense, law enforcement, and intelligence. The format is very much like what we're intending to do here today. Uh, at the Cyber Dialogue, there are no set presentations. Instead, there are conversations and, and just a, a, an ongoing dialogue among people who maybe don't necessarily uh, see things from the same starting point. Um, we've had several themes. Uh, the last uh, year was about um, uh, the question of whether you could have governance without government in cyberspace. And we have a trailer from last year um, that attempts to summarize the conversations that, what, that went on there, but also point towards what we want to do next year at the Cyber Dialogue, which will take place uh, March 30 and 31st, 2014. So without uh, further ado, I'll show the trailer and then uh, come back and explain a bit about the theme for today's conversation. Thank you. Uh-oh. Okay, well, uh, while they're working on it, <laughs> never fail. Um, so the, the, uh, the topic for next year's Cyber Dialogue, uh, after the last event, we decided that it needed to be about a different kind of conversation that needed to happen uh, between uh, stakeholders roughly, in, and I'm, I'm not quite sure the language to use here myself, uh, between, let's say, North and South. Um, I've... Uh, again, through experiences I personally have, but also of my colleagues, it's clear that um, the vast majority of the users of what we call cyberspace are coming from countries of the global south. And yet, a lot of the policy discussion uh, takes place in places like Silicon Valley, in Washington, D.C. And again, I foresee a problem happening here, that um, uh, those where the technology was invented and the constituencies stakeholders that make up uh, the, and who invented the internet um, are, are um, uh, not really understanding that the users today and into the future are coming from countries that in many cases have a much different context, have different policy, economic, security challenges. And I think it's interesting that these uh, huge rates of growth in the global south are, are occurring at a time when cybersecurity is at the top of the agenda, especially now in the wake of the Snowden revelations. Um, my own concerns I've had about those revelations, putting aside their content, certainly putting aside Edward Snowden's motivations himself, I have big concerns that um, the short-term implications of these revelations are going to be mostly negative that uh, uh, as we have begun to see, countries will seek to insulate themselves, especially from the United States and US-owned uh, networks and companies, but in doing so, uh, uh, might set up systems of nationalized controls. 
Uh, also, I, I fear greatly that many of those countries will want to uh, essentially imitate the NSA or create localized versions of the NSA. And meanwhile, there is a huge defense industrial complex waiting in the wings to service that desire uh, that will also fuel it. And so together, I think uh, we, we are at uh, a precipice, in my opinion, a very dangerous time coming that we need to address for all of those reasons. Video, I've been told, is ready. <laughs> so why don't we show that video and then when we get back, since I've already uh, described the content of next year's Cyber Dialogue, we can get right into the conversation. So let's try it again. Is it possible to turn the lights down, Rob, without unplugging something? Oh, no. It's not. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, yeah. Yeah, FET, FET actually has to leave, so the first thing I'm going to do is turn over to FET, who's had, of course, his entire career focused in on research and issues around this. I'm just going to switch gears a bit and talk about the, the very population you're talking about, Ron, about the, um, don't really quite like the term, but we use it anyways as a shorthand, the bottom of the pyramid users, the next, uh, uh, next wave of users in the future, and particularly mobile phones. Uh, IDRC has been supporting uh, research in looking at uh, users of the poorest of the poor, people living on uh, incomes that are less than $2 a day. Um, this is a decade-long research looking at mobile access. Um, as you know, a lot of big numbers being thrown around, particularly ITU throwing around the numbers of 6 billion mobile users. Um, our own research tends to um, have that number a bit lower um, because we estimate about 4 to 5 billion that in the methodology we um, adopt, adopted in looking at uh, mobile use, looked at public access, shared access, double SIMs, these things that are not accounted for. Um, I think the numbers that are thrown around globally are looking at the supply side. Um, Aspen Telecoms, how many SIM, active SIMs are out there? And that's not um, accurate. So, point about methodology. Um, it's interesting at uh, when, you're inter when you're interviewing and surveying um, users in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, again, this is um, over a span of almost a decade. Um, and credit goes to Thirsty, RIA, or in Asia. Sorry for all the acronyms. Um, there's a monograph that we're going to produce about this uh, that we can share later with you um, about these findings. But uh, inter uh, internet users in these countries uh, access the net uh, through their mobile phone. But when asked uh, if, they, if they know what the internet is, the answer is almost no, almost always no. But uh, people are accessing fa Facebook through their mobile phone. So it's an interesting uh, finding about perception. Um, another uh, significant finding um, globally is that the poorest of the poor are, paying, are spending 5 to 20 percent of their income on telecom. That's huge. Um, consider how much of your income you're willing to give to telecom. Um, and, you know, one can make it, uh, an argument that that's, um, there's perhaps perceived benefits, rational decisions, economic decisions, and that expenditure. Or one can make an argument that it's perhaps a, a, a form of taxation, a burden. It's the way the modern world is, and we need, it's a necessity. Um, the other major finding, and of course, perhaps obvious, but I think needed interrogation anyways, is that the access was, was predominantly, mobile access was predominantly for security and for social connectivity. Things uh, we take for granted, uh, but expenditures of 5 to 20 percent, that's quite significant. Um, and the last point is that there is, at the global aggregate level, um, findings that suggest that uh, mobile access, internet access, contributes directly to GDP, um, but there's a question of causality, right? whether or not uh, rich people have access or because they have access, therefore they're rich. Um, so 
we're interested in looking at methodologies that would interrogate uh, linking access with livelihood. And I think that's, uh, uh, from a development point of view, that's a, a significant task for the development community to work out and before we sort of uh, uh, make the conclusion that uh, mobile access and internet access is super beneficial to the poor. So I just want to lay out that context of users. I, I think there's going to be, I think there's, I agree with you that there's going to be a counter narrative of, of um, particularly um, uh, surveillance of old mobile, uh, the name for the name of security. I don't, I, I don't think, I think there's going to be a backlash in that sense. That, uh, you, I, I'm based in Delhi. Um, Delhi and in India, they're, 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 they're rolling up the most, the biggest, the, the, the biggest uh, identification system in the universe. Universal identification. I'm not sure if you know about this. I mean, on the one hand, uh, the argument is that it's about national security, uh, terrorism. Um, on the other hand, it's about social and wealth, uh, social welfare and, and distributing benefits. I don't think it's that black and white this sort of issue. But I think the the discourse around uh, security and terrorism will, will the answer will be up because of some real revolution. That's my opinion. You're in India, which is a critical country for this conversation, right? It's uh, the place where, I don't know if it is now, but probably soon will be the most internet users in the world, probably. Um, and it also is typical in some ways in that it has huge governance challenges, but also as uh, our friend Sunil uh, points out often, major security issues on a constant basis in, in local areas throughout the country as a whole that have to be dealt with somehow. And so uh, I've noticed, and many people are noticing, that India is starting to develop a cyber security strategy. So how do you think that will look like? What do you think will be the content of India's cyber security strategy? Um, I think Larry didn't answer a, a good portion of this uh, question. I think at the moment, uh, under the um, ICT Act, there's um, uh, there's some abuses uh, from the state right now in using that act to um, in the name of security, uh, but it really it was uh, uh, political defamation. Um, ambiguity is about uh, defamation and security within that act sort of has to be amended. Um, I don't see a process that's happening that. I don't see a process that's happening that is multi-stakeholder in, in this process and that, that would derive at um, some sort of uh, cyber security law and regulation at the moment. Um, and the, in terms of internet penetration, we have to remember it's about 12% of the population has internet and most of that is mobile phone. And this is the elite of the elite uh, within India. So while the numbers seem to use, I don't think um, it's a bit exaggerated in terms of access. Uh, increasingly, it will, it will be about mobile phone. I don't think the distinction between mobile access interaction, I, I think we should do away with that distinction. Everything's over IT at the moment, right? So it's, it's an, uh, the offline online distinction also should be it's blurred at the moment. Specific uh, comments that people want to make in reaction to or questions to FET before I, I forgot to mention at the outset, I'm sorry, FET, that FET has to leave to catch a plane, so that's why he's actually leaving. Although we had a kind of inside joke, he was going to storm off. And, you know, <laughs> um, so, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to try and show the video game for a while. Um, so, there are some questions here. Robert, can you take the mic around, please, to the people? and. Uh, Thank you. Over here, Lynette, and then and maybe you could quickly introduce yourself. Sure. Hi. I'm Lynette Taylor from Oxford University. I study big data in developing countries. Um, um, however, formally, I studied the mismatch between ICT statistics and reality, um, particularly in Africa, but I'm interested in the same thing is going on in Asia. Can you talk about whether there is sort of misdirection going on in terms of policy and in terms of the rights discussion because of belief that far more people are online than actually are, 
or are online in different ways than they actually are, because I, I think you have a very good insight on that. Uh, let me try to see if I understand the question. Is a deliberate distortion of, of the system? Well, I, I don't think there's any major conspiracy. I think it's a question of uh, gathering data. I mean, that's the easiest sort of method to look at uh, the supply side and look at active since. Um, we, through um, uh, grants with the University of Washington, looked at public access. So in the early days, it was looking at public sector and looking at access through that form. Um, and now as we sort of evolve and look at mobile phones, we're looking at the sort of shared access some people say mobile phones are sort of a killer app to telecenters. I think that's a yes. I don't know the situation depending on which country they're at. If you ask the Philippines, that's not the case. Um, and India was rolling out 100,000 telecenters at one point. So I think the research community can do uh, better in thinking and, and consolidating methodologies and understanding uh, the numbers. Um, but clearly, we can make a conclusion that uh, mobile access is uh, good morning. I'm in the Kassan Kader Buterbaku from UNESCO Paris. Um, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. I have one question and a little bit something to clarify with you. Um, you said what, uh, when you ask uh, mobile phone users what the internet is, most of them really didn't know. Did you carry out any kind of assessment, competence assessment of those users? How did you come to this uh, conclusion? That's quite interesting for us, because we, uh, we, uh, we would like to carry out a sort of similar thing. We're just coming with media information literacy assessment framework in a few weeks' time, and what kind of questions will be asked? Um, the, the, and this is mainly, the figures come from Africa, um, and it's through an organization, Research ICT Africa, RIA, um, a part of a global network, RIA Learn Asia and University in Latin America looking at this, and it was a seven-year study, uh, the, the, so looked at a, a sample, and I apologize, I, I'm actually representing a colleague who, who was responsible for the um, research. The sample uh, was initially investigated and asked about perceptions about what they were using and whether or not they understood what the internet was, what they used it for, etc. And then the same group of people were, were revisited um, just recently, a year ago, we serve the server that, and the perception still was, well, we don't use internet, what, what really is that? Then when, when asked, what do you do on your mobile phone, what would be Facebook? And often, you, and you see um, Facebook and social networking, in, in at least the developing countries, package as part of the phone, and sort of the plan, et cetera. Um, um, uh, I don't know if, if you can make an argument, it's just a question of definition, and what's significant about that. Um, we, just, we felt that it was significant to understand um, who uh, thought they were connected and, 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 and not, and what they were using it for. So that was actually an unintended uh, finding. Um, we just really wanted to know what they were using it for. And social networking was the primary use. Um, and it turned out that they perceived that they weren't on the net. And I, again, I think uh, in, a, in a few years' time, this distinction also be, won't be as significant as we think it is now. That's just my opinion. Okay, so for that, we're kind of focusing on that for a few minutes until you have to leave. But when do you have to leave? Uh, thank you. My name you have to leave five minutes ago. So yes, definitely thank, thank you. My name is Eddie. I'm from the Indonesian Agility Society, or we call it Master in Indonesia. Uh, you said that in India they are rolling out um, almost 100 telecenters throughout the region. Um, we, we do also have the uh, same, um, same uh, problem like, like that in Indonesia. What I would like uh, to ask you on how, how do they manage the daily activities of the telecenter and how do they fund it? And um, do uh, they also provide the uh, special content for the telecenter, for instance, for, for, for the educational? A tutorial. Thank you. The um, the um, we were talking about one village, one people. In any case, uh, in India, the the, um, the 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 decision of the government to roll out what they call community information centers uh, was uh, 
indirect consequence to our support to the Swami Nathan Foundation and their uh, alliance building around Tele Center, which has become a global um, movement, and, and uh, we've supported that over a decade. Um, and, and work especially in Indonesia as well and the Philippines. Um, um, in terms of operations uh, and sustaining that, it's been a major challenge. I think it's going to remain a challenge. Um, it's heavily subsidized and, and without um, international funding and without government support, it's difficult to find models that work. And not to say that they don't. I think uh, you see um, you see initiatives in Africa that moves towards more than mobile. Access and, and services, add-on services. So I think the sustainability is around the sort of add-on services. But the telesafe centers that exist now, there are, for example, the, um, the IGNU Open University uh, certificate for telecenter operators. Again, this comes directly from our funding. Um, that I really don't have a, a simple answer. Uh, or a clear answer for you. I think uh, the telecenter movement. I just met with them in the Philippines just a few months ago, and they are struggling and thinking about how to sustain that. There are nodes within that movement. Europe is doing well uh, in that. Um, in my own country, in Canada, the, the, the movement in Maritimes and the territories, that, that was successful. Um, they are, again, confronting the idea of um, everyone's going mobile access. What is the, what is the function of an all-purpose uh, telecenter hub uh, in rural communities? Um, the, the language before was around uh, providing employment, um, uh, information services around. I, I, personally, I think it, it should be linked to uh, agricultural extension. Um, and of course, in India, that's quite significant. Um, no, so no simple answer for you. Um, it, it, at the moment, heavily subsidized. Beth really has to go now, and I appreciate you even taking the time to come. So, Beth, thank you for you know sharing your insights in this area with us, and it's good to see you again. Uh, yep. <laughs> We're going to do it. Thank you, Beth. Uh, where I wanted to go, uh, actually, after the video, was to ask the, the panels to go through the panel one more, one time, and. Um, and, you know, answer the question when we think about this topic. You know, the fact that the vast majority of users are coming from the global south. From your perspective, and from the perspective of the communities of which you are a part, what do you think are the most important questions we should be asking? So I, I want us to start with you, Jeff. Let me Well, I, I come from the Arab region, I'm from Morocco, and I think, um, I mean, we're probably all here familiar with all the challenges, you know, that uh, people from the Arab region are facing at the moment. I think, um, you know, the region is still in kind of turmoil situation, and um, people, the, uh, the elite, somehow embrace the internet connection because they, they manage to find a way change the regimes locally using the internet, but it doesn't stop there because I think there are a lot of challenges that um, uh, generally people are facing in, in, in the Arab region at the moment. And I think one of the most uh, important topics that we're working on um, in the program we're running in Hivos is actually to try to engage civic actors more in the policy making process. And it proved to be very, very uh, difficult to engage with governments from the Arab region um, to speak about the issues at stake, and most of them are related to, you know, freedoms and and then you know the legislation in place that usually hinders uh, civil rights. So I think uh, the use of the internet in the Arab region at the moment, as it stands, because I think somehow we're talking about access, you know, to the internet. I think it peaked, obviously, according to the uh, recent statistics we, we've seen. It's kind of an emerging market you know, in terms of, of access. But um, when we uh, want to decode how this internet is being used, we have a, a big question mark to, to, to answer because um, most, you know, uh, youth generation um, are using the internet at the moment just to access Facebook or to tweet and even the content is not valuable. So it's, it's mainly used for joking and, 
and so on. There is only a very small majority of, of or a community of bloggers who are trying to reflect on you know local issues. So content and even in Arabic is a very very critical issue at the moment in the region, and we're trying to see how this internet can be used for sustainable development because that's what people relate more to. So people would like to use the internet for you know to 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 basically improve their, their standards of living, for education, um, to be able to air their opinions about the current issues, to have a new environment where they can exchange you know, information and, and be more on the top of how they can air their concerns at the global level and at the local level as well. So it, it, it's quite a complicated you know, uh, situation because there is no kind of um, strategy from you know, the Arab region on how to use the internet effectively. And that's a problem in itself. So the government is probably working on deploying the necessary infrastructure for more access, but there isn't a clear plan on how the internet can be used efficiently. And at the moment, there is a whole hype of how to, uh, you know, people enjoy actually using the internet so much, but just for fun, not for lucrative purposes. I want to come back to you on that, but I wanted to quickly turn to Waleed, if you don't mind, before getting back to Jack, um, because keep it in the, the region, so to speak. Waleed, you're from Yemen, and you, of course, spend a lot of time thinking about this region. Picking up what Hanan is saying, do you feel like there is a, uh, a disjuncture between the vast majority of internet users and the political leadership in the region? How is that manifest? How do you see that playing itself out? I mean, uh, I'll just give you an anecdote. Um, Hanan and I are actually colleagues and, and uh, working together on the Arab IGF. And uh, on one panel I moderated was on openness and content. And on that panel, it was quite clear that there's a huge divide between the young generation and the older generation. You could tell very clearly that the young generation is eager to create change. There was a, a colleague uh, of activist from Jordan who has voiced his concern on, about the blocking of websites. And blocking of websites is quite a popular phenomenon in the Arab region. I mean, it happens almost in every Arab country. So he was quite furious about what happened in Jordan recently with the blocking of so many hundreds of websites and news websites and so forth. So as a moderator of the session, I allowed him to speak openly. And he was rather harsh in relative terms because he used the word the government may be confused and imagine that there was actually a, a representative from that country and he just he got agitated because he is confused it's you see how early we are in the democratic process uh, and this was supposed to be a forum where people com i mean share ideas and, and they debate so the at that moment i got a request to shut this person down Imagine being in that position. So you can tell, I mean, obviously I did not. I allowed him to continue to the end and gave the uh, floor the I mean, opportunity to respond to his comments. But you can see this was a clear demonstration that the country is changing and the countries are changing. People are beginning to see a glimmer of, of hope in having new generations connected to the internet, trying to voice their views openly critiquing and venues such as Arab IGF could serve as a manifestation of this uh, gap. However, it's much deeper than simply a moderated session. It falls within the lines of government. So if you look back in history in the region, you'd see that oppression, oppression has been you know, a trait of these countries. So it takes much longer than simply one revolution to change all that overnight. It would require incremental change, social behavior, should begin to also change, not only on the political level, if I may say, but also on the cultural level, on the basic community level. People are not used to convey opinions openly. It's, it's a matter, and that's why I, perf I uh, agree with man that people are beginning to use the internet for less you know, more mundane tasks and I mean, entertainment issues, because they have not matured enough to immediately begin to go all the way for politics in terms of I mean, there are some uh, good examples, but I'm talking about the mainstream. So it would be very rare to find someone openly going forth with a critical article on against the particular minister and so forth. So it takes a bit of awareness, it takes education, and that's why I'd say the intern, I always say to my students who 
whom I teach at Arab University about the internet. Internet is, is a manifestation of reality. It's a reflection. It's a mirror that conveys what's going on. People are beginning to really uh, understand that it's not some unique, ideal, uh, say, world. It's a reflection of reality, but it is also a catalyst for change. So it accelerates change. The thing is that uh, in the Arab world, we need to have both approaches offline and online. You cannot simply go online expect things to change. You have to have a, a, an educational track, a capacity building track on the ground. So I really commend ideas such as Hivos's ideas of training people to understand what it is for and why it's important for change. And that takes long and it takes perseverance and patience. I just want to ask one more question to you and Hanan before going to Jack. So apologies, Jack, for giving you away. So one, you, so you have this division that you describe between you know, the users, the young users, and the, the, the leadership as a complex relationship. Another uh, complex relationship that we experienced at the University of Toronto was between research and advocacy groups in that region and us coming in uh, when we were setting up the Cyber Stewards Network. Uh, we we kind of got uh, slapped down, I would say, in the list. And I'm wondering if you could describe a bit about the impressions that happened at the time, where they came from, and um, maybe a bit about your recommendations. And, and then similarly, what your perspective is, because you interact with a lot of av advocacy groups, research groups in the region, how they feel about interactions with communities, whether they're activist communities or research communities in the so-called North. I mean, you really hit the very sensitive uh, topic. Uh, in fact, a lot of advocates and activists in the region are wary of quote unquote Western agenda. I don't know if you heard that, but it's popular in the Arab world and the conspiracy theories have been dominating for a long time. And the thing is that uh, they are like an accumulation of events and, and stories and issues and scandals, uh, latest uh, in a serious is the NSA revelations, of course, and these actually indirectly harm, you know, uh, people with good intentions, such as this Silicon Lab <laughs> and other uh, Harvard University's Berkman Center, and many others who are willing to engage with the community, but because of, you know, their fate of being geographically located in a country that's known to do uh, evil stuff, it's become really consequential and negatively consequential on their actions. So the thing is here is that I, I come from Yemen and I understand the context, I understand the, the frustration of, of both sides. I mean, there are people in the Arab world who, who are willing to engage, I am among them. But there are also people who are reluctant, not only because they may already understand, I might not say believe in this uh, conspiracy theory, but because the surrounding environment is not in, in, in empowering them, it's not helping them you know, uh, build the bridge, and it would may it may even lead to reputational issues within their environment. So it could cause them harm directly. So uh, one very important step to take is to begin exploring means and methods of building bridges and trying to break, uh, say, uh, end the stereotype that if you were based on, in a society or a country that may have certain you know political, uh, let's say. Uh, approaches that you don't like. It does not necessarily reflect on every single member of society. And that would require um, extending a hand and coming over to the region and opening up. Staying where you are may not help. I mean, it won't never lead to a solution. Inactive, uh, um, being inactive will not help. But there is an approach of mutual uh, understanding in terms of seeing what could work and what could not. Getting an approach of not dictating what researchers should think or should do, but coming to them and engaging them directly and saying, okay, we are here as your guests. We have to learn what you want, what do you need, what can we do together in terms of cooperating. So it, it begins with an open agenda, not something that's been scripted before. And you. Yeah, I'd like to feed into what um, uh, Walid uh, has just said. I mean, from my experience working at the global level, uh, the Arab region proved to be very uh, kind of specific when it comes on how to engage with people at the local level. Um, obviously people are, are, are more kind of prone to engage with organizations who are willing 
to work on the ground, and that's what we try to do uh, at Hibos. We organize um, ground trainings, like on-site trainings in different um, Arab region countries, and uh, at the same time, uh, we're trying to um, not to set an agenda, you know, for, for these countries. We would like, you know, civic actors to define the issues at stake and address them from their own perspective. All what we provide is, is a framework and a kind of a platform for these people to come together. Obviously, we're trying to, um, um, to strengthen their knowledge um, as far as internet governance is concerned, but we would like to focus on the issues at stake in the Arab region. Um, there is a lot of work to be done to, um, to build capacity in terms of the principles, you know, the stakeholders, the issues, what's going on at the global level, so they can get, you know, used to the conversation. But I happened to discover this year that internet governance is the least of priorities, you know, for, for civic actors. And to be engaged in the dialogue proves to be very, very difficult because they don't relate to it because they were excluded from the very beginning. So what we want now is to expand not only at the level of multi, you know, the stakeholders, like have civil society, but literally expand the number of representation from different regions, because the agenda at the moment is mainly dominated by uh, either American organizations analyzing what's going on in the region. People don't want that anymore. They would like to analyze their own, you know, issues related to surveillance, censorship, to all these kind of, uh, you know, the, 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 the red buttons. So we're trying to press them, but at the same time, we need to try to, um, to build capacity on how to strategically engage with government. Because as Walid said, working in the Arab region is just so difficult. And the experience in Algeria, for example, it was, it was very striking. It set us back many, many, many years because we just couldn't, you know, um, engage with the government. And there was a huge misunderstanding about even the concept. Now, governance in the Arab region means government for some people. Policy does not even exist. Policy is politics. So there is an issue with term terminology. And when we want to engage new people, and obviously we need to have the actors in place, we can't have governments only taking over the show. We need to build, um, you know, a civic society that is able to discuss these issues at the government level. And usually all the actors we work with have kind of revolutionary ideas and are very forward and that doesn't work. It just simply doesn't work. Why? Because it's in the culture, it's inherent. But as Walid said, we're not used to have a conversation with each other. The concept of civil society does not exist even as a concept. You know, the governments are not used to, you know, consult with people. So it's really a hard process, but you know, we, we've already started working on this. It's just going to take a very, very long time to convince different parties that we need to have a multi-stakeholder dialogue. That's what we are at at the moment. Now, then we come to you know, speak about the issues at stake, freedom of expression, the current legislation, how it, it contradicts you know, with civil liberties. Um, Arab governments usually find the easy way out, applying offline legislation online and things like that, which are not compatible. And, you know, uh, this, this obviously hinders a lot of other opportunities, you know, where businesses and big companies would like to invest in the region. Um, but if there isn't, you know, the, uh, the necessary platform for mm -hmm. that, not only access, but if, if the internet is not open enough, it will hinder other opportunities. So now we're at how to establish the link between you know, the economic benefits of the internet and freedom. We really need to find that kind of balance. That's what we need. In, in the North, we speak about how to find the balance between security and freedom. But in the Arab region, I think it's, it's economy. You know, to speak to government, you have to talk business. And you know, to speak about rights as well, you really need to connect it on how an open internet will contribute you know, um, um, uh, in, in economic development. So the homework for next year, you know, why we're doing this project is to establish that link by doing research, you know, by trying to, you know, uh, highlight that clearly, um, you know, and have policy recommendations on that basis. Interesting insight. So, Jack, I want to come over to you now. <laughs> uh, so you've had probably more experience than many people in this room on the issues that we're talking about, and I just want to to ask you what your reactions are to these conversations. Um, 
the reason I sort of passed the mic around because I wasn't sure whether we were talking about um, internet governance issues or whether we were talking about access or whether we were talking about both. I think we're talking about both. So maybe I will start talking about um, issues around access. So I work a lot with women's rights organizations as well as with sexual rights organizations. And when we talk about internet access for women and looking at it from a gender lens, then we really need to ask several key questions. Um, one is around control over resources, who has control over resources and what are the existing disparities within that. And then next is around control over mobility, even simple things like where can you go and where you can't go. And then control over narratives, perspectives and reality. So I'll go through them each in turn. The one that, that has um, most attention when it comes to things, when it comes to discussions and policy debates around um, increasing access, and access is a big issue these days, um, is control over resources. So we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about cost, we're talking about what is the best platform, and so on and so forth. Um, and I was um, at two meetings this year where this was kind of like the primary issue as well. So that UNESCO started a working group on broadband, there is like a working group agenda and broadband working group commission. Um, and then there is this alliance that was formed late last year called Wixart, looking at mobile phones and um, access for women. And all of this has to do with the Millennium Development Goals expiring and the post-2016 development agenda. So it's really very much within this metric. Um, and that's important because then you need to look at, when you look at cost, then you need to look at who has, um, there is definitely a gender disparity in terms of income, in terms of um, being able to have gainful employment, and even when you have gainful employment, there is a disparity between that. So I guess that, that is actually the basic premise to start looking at things, and that, that, in, that, that matters in terms of at the end of the day, who can afford even a mobile phone, or who can afford a, tab a tablet, or who can afford like, you know, one hour in a family. So that's kind of like an important question to ask. Um, and then, but before you even go there, there is the issue of literacy. So even literacy, there is a gender gap. It doesn't mean, you know, there is a disparity between um, education. So you actually even have to start from, from that level, no? whether you can read or not. Um, and what is, the, what is the kind of like emphasis on, on um, education for um, your son and your daughter? And, and we know that there is a difference in, in, in terms of our experience. And then, you know, and then from there you move on forward in terms of production of content and so on. Um, but I think one thing I would like to caution against in terms of um, access on, uh, in relation to infrastructure is this whole kind of drive towards mobile phone as the silver bullet to answer all access issues, especially for women. I think this is, um, this is sort of, you know, we, have, we can be, um, we can run the risk of actually falling into some kind of a, 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 a marketing discourse as well. I think um, there is a recognition that women is the next big market. Um, that, 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 you know, most, most women are still not connected yet. There is a gender digital gap. So probably the next billion, most of them are women. So, you know, and we need to give them mobile phones. Because mobile phones is the cheapest and it's the best. But, that, but it also spoils the fastest. Um, it also has the danger of wall garden security is an issue. The types of content we have is quite different. So I think all of these questions don't get discussed, and uh, we need to be quite careful around this rhetoric. Um, and and there is a you know there is a private sector and government relationship as well in relation to this. And I think civil society also needs to be a bit more critical. Just just you know or, or other actors actually not just civil society. Just to ask a little bit more. Actually, what kind of content will we get, and what is the impact of that in terms of trying to access the benefits of things? So then going over to control over mobility, we talked about, I think on day zero, we talked about this um, campaign in Saudi Arabia with the hashtag women to drive. And uh, this basically was a hashtag women to drive. Um, and this happened in, I think, I think it was probably last year, where, you know, um, that in, many, in Saudi Arabia, it's illegal for women to drive. So you're not allowed to go in a car and drive on your own. And in many countries, actually, it's quite difficult for you to go out and drive on your own. So they decided to start this campaign one and, and, and hashtag it, you know, start talking about it on Twitter and hashtag women to drive and then they started talking about it and then, and then eventually they decided to translate this into action. One day in June, let's all go out and drive. So then, and then, um, one, of, uh, and then uh, one of the people who were part of this campaign, somebody videoed her driving and going out on the street and then she was put, I think she was put to jail. So that, that response came out to it. But, but, you, but you see how, in, this actually highlights how in, the, you know, the connection between mobility, um, empowerment, you know, control over the spaces that you occupy in order to be able to define it. And I think this is a very important question to think about when we talk about issues like telecenters, when we talk about issues like these kind of public internet access points as solutions towards trying to get access to the most disadvantaged. Actually, who can go there? And really, a lot of women don't have time, especially the women you want to target. 
the women who already have access to control over economics and resources probably have their own, you know, probably have their own infrastructure. So we also need to think about these issues uh, when it comes to stuff like that. So the layer of cultural and norms and social um, differential social expectations, this is the layer that policy often don't want to get into because it will expose a lot of discriminatory um, approaches that they have um, in thinking about policy. But that is exactly the thing that we need to target and be much more nuanced and sophisticated in understanding to make things um, to make things matter, I guess, to have an impact, to have an impact that is beyond just rhetoric. Um, and finally, control over content and narratives and perspectives. So first, you have, you know, you're able to get access, and then you're able to get use the access to do stuff, and then you have that capacity and literacy. And, and, but once you do stuff and you want to write your stories out there, then they also can get control and blocked and, 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 and gotten rid of. So in Indonesia itself, we did a research um, last year. So we're doing this global monitoring survey every year and we're talking to sexual rights activists, what do you use the internet for and what kinds of challenges do you face. So out of our survey, 99% said yes, the internet is critical in our work, we really need the internet in order to advance our work. Um, but 58% say that we actually face some kind of issue in terms of, you know, whether it's um, blocking, threats, intimidation, etc. So and, and I think up to 13%, up to 13% said as a response to this, we walk away. We just stop doing what we're doing. So that's really quite, you know, that's, that's something quite sobering. Um, and in Indonesia itself, we have some colleagues who work here um, whose websites on sexual rights, information on, about sexual rights, sexual education, got blocked under the Pornography Act. So that's also quite challenging. And I think with this, we really, it really brings to mind that we need to have a very strong, clear, and committed human rights framework in thinking about all of these issues in terms of how we want to approach this as, as different stakeholders and what this means to us. So as a, as a government, what, what, um, you know, what committing to the human rights framework means to you as a business and as civil as society, as technical community and so on and so forth. And I think I'll stop here for you. Your, point, your last point about the blocking of, of the sexual rights sites in Indonesia reminds me that we to say to, to the group here that we're doing a, a study on Indonesian information controls while we're here, our group. And we found uh, exactly what you're talking about in our test. So internet uh, filtering here on the ISPs in Indonesia, that sites that are not pornographic, uh, that fall into this category, are being blocked. The other thing it reminds me of a mutual colleague of ours, Helmi Noman, who's in the uh, Middle East. Uh, he has for long said that it would be interesting to do a study that systematically looked at what happens to the, uh, the organizations whose websites get filtered. Like what, you know, once they're blocked somewhere, he, his perception, echoing what you're saying, is that uh, uh, they, they can, there's a risk that they just forget about it. Let's do something else. Let's go offline, right? And, and I think that's uh, something that needs to be tracked in, in research. I'd, I'd like to uh, open up to people in the audience, especially we had some other people on the panel who couldn't make it today, so it'd be nice to hear if it's possible from people from Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, but of course other people as well, you're welcome. Uh, thank you for uh, the panelists and for the organizer for such an exciting panel. And uh, I've heard quite a few exciting points that I would like to pick on, but I'll choose the three points. Two of them regarding Hanan and Walid and what they have said about uh, Arab public, their level of engagement, the level of political participation online as, as much. And uh, I would like first to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Abir Najjar, and I'm a university professor at the American University of Sharjah. I come from Jordan, and I'm with the uh, Freedom House delegation. I wrote the Jordan chapter about online freedom. And I would like, uh, I, I wasn't quite, um, although I understand and I respect the opinions that were expressed by the panelists, but I wasn't very, um, uh, comfortable with uh, the criticism of the lack of political participation and from the Arab public point of view and the fact there is so much of political satire but at the end of the day if you follow uh, many of the young people, adults, uh, politi politicians, journalists on Twitter and Facebook, you will find plenty of uh, so many, all the major issues are being dealt with and are being discussed many of the political opinions are being clearly expressed, communicated, and distributed around many circles. So that's, that's point number one. Point number two, in terms of agenda of 
uh, whatever conversation we're having, whether in terms of governance or in terms of access, which uh, I had, um, uh, I just listened to a great approach to uh, as how to deal with access. It's very important to uh, go to uh, many civil society uh, organizations in the Arab country with, uh, as Walid suggested earlier, with an open-minded uh, minded sort of approach in the sense of, you know what's going on, let's try to work something out. And I think from that very particular perspective, I can propose two important things that could be uh, it, that could be picked on. One of them is the issue of the transparency. There is so much of vagueness when it comes to laws, the different laws under which uh, uh, freedom rights activists, advocates, etc., are being uh, brought into, in, in, in some countries, military uh, uh, courts. Uh, there is very, very important need for clarity from the side of the government and from the side of judiciary as in the sense of how do we and in what situations do we bring these people and what makes them liable for penal code or for, for being uh, uh, persecuted under any of these laws at work, whether it's copyright, whether it's penal code, whether it's any other law. Uh, number two issue that I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to pick on in, in terms of government, civil society organizations are not reluctant or uh, uh, somehow they're not um, um, capable, it's not that I'm, I'm just trying to refute the fact that they're not capable of working with the government, they're begging the government in so many countries for an access to talk to them, but the government for some reason after the Arab Spring, they're just not willing to listen. And uh, that's not confrontational, but that's true. In many countries, I know that, for example, in Jordan, in Egypt, in so many other countries, if you're not pleasing the government, they wouldn't listen to you. So I think there has to be some work of diplomacy towards the government to bring them down to the table of conversation. There is no trust yet, but trust could be built. And this is conflict communication. This is part of what this forum is trying to do, to establish links and bridges. That's the title of, of the session. I'm sorry I took so long. I just needed yeah. to say whatever I, I say. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, rather than go back, maybe I'll uh, have somebody uh, go to next. And then uh, just before you comment, uh, video people, Jenny, if you could let me know when there's enough time at the end to show that so we don't run out of time to show both videos. Ox plug video. Okay. Why? Signal me. Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, YJ Bak from uh, Sydney, Korea. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for this uh, great session. And as I just mentioned, like sort of uh, a lot of the panelists seem to address this success issue. So I wanted to address more like uh, internet governance uh, perspective, especially like uh, trust uh, dimension. Uh, I think the synonym of the trust is sort of like security. And there are a lot of the different uh, dimensions of security. And uh, Ron mentioned about this the Snowden incident, but uh, I wanted to address sort of like the security of the country called Tableau Dominion, uh, which has been addressed like in several uh, platforms. So uh, if I uh, reflect so my first experience with this cybersecurity approach to country called Tableau Dominion was like 10 years ago. Uh, back in 2003, when there was like a visit the pre-regional consultation meeting organized by uh, ESQA uh, back in Beirut, there were like a lot of the ministers from that region start to talk about this uh, security issues of the CCTLVs. And then 10 years now, I think probably like a lot of this region uh, feel more secure with their country for top level domain names in, in, that, in some sense. But we still have the unsolved issues of the CCTLD uh, issues, especially with this island. A lot of these uh, islands from Caribbean region and also Pacific region, they have been still struggling to uh, take back their authority to operate their own the CCTLD registry. Because as of today, a lot of those small island CCTLDs are operated outside of their country and the island, and which they don't really have any specific platform they have to address with. And if they go to ICANN, 
and ICANN doesn't have uh, such kind of political authority to solve that redelegation issue, and they cannot really go to ITU because ITU doesn't have any authority to do, deal with any detailed issues. I think this is a very uh, substantial issue to solve before we have this uh, billion users on the internet because otherwise, you know, if we cannot uh, build this trust in this network, uh, it's going to be very difficult to uh, achieve this billion users in the same network. So I think sort of addressing this the CCTLD security uh, in this process also can be very critical. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, are there other comments, interventions people want to make at this point? So you bring up an, an oh, there's one over there. Oh, no, that's fine. No, let's get, get some input from the audience. Hi, my name is uh, Dave Moskowitz from Internet New Zealand. And uh, I guess the governance issue that I'd like to raise is uh, how, look, okay, the last uh, couple of billion of internet users have come from countries where there is generally a healthy tension between government, between civil society, and between the private sector. And that healthy tension has helped enable uh, each one of those stakeholders uh, to have a significant say in how things are run. My concern is that the next billion users are coming from countries that are mainly captured by government, where governments have a disproportionate power compared to uh, the, the other potential stakeholders. So what can we do as the existing several billion internet users uh, who are already there and already having this conversation, what can we do to ensure uh, that the voice of the people in the countries that these next billion users are coming from are not completely captured by their government. How can we ensure that they have a seat at this table, the table that we're at right now, in formulating the discussion and making decisions? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. And I would actually like to put that to the entire audience here. I'd really like to hear people's opinion. What, what do we do about this? So maybe I'll start. Uh, anybody want to jump on that? Up here. Um, what do we do? Um, first of all, I think it's very hard to make um, such a broad sweeping statement as well that there are some countries which are disconnected currently, or you know, still have a large proportion of people who are not connected on the internet. On the internet, who is mostly captured by the government. I think uh, that's that's kind of a little bit. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure how helpful that is actually um, to try and like unpack. The, the particular particularities of um, of um, I guess a uh, participatory um, decision making in terms of internet governance, and I also think we need to expand this um, concept. I think yesterday I heard this concept by Jeanette Hoffman, which is really great. Like, unblackboxing multi-stakeholder, and what do we mean by that? You know, because often we have this magic one that we build around, and each of us have different conceptions of what this magic one is, and sometimes it's an old one. We actually bring this like old tripartite relationship, which is not new, um, of, of private sector, civil society, and state into this conversation of, of internet governance. But actually, there, there, there may be other people involved and other people who have a huge stake. For example, technical community, which is kind of a little bit there and there and everywhere. Um, and then, and then to, to kind of like um, think through within these different stakeholders as well, what are the what are the different kinds of viewpoints and concerns that are being brought forward by different people with different expertise? So it's not even necessarily homogeneous in a sense. And I think that in many countries where there are transitionary democracies, there's huge opportunities to rethink what is um, what is participatory democracy now? Like you know, we know that these old ways of, of working isn't quite working. We don't really want like such huge, um, say, for example, uh, military influence in, in the way that things are being run, and that cannot be the safeguard against another kind of like um, um, another kind of power. So how then do we kind of try to reconstruct this? And I think in, in kind of like um, trans transitioning democracy, especially there is a, a, an acute awareness of the internet as being a public sphere. And I think with that, that actually creates an, an enormous opportunity to rethink about how do we want to govern this public sphere. Um, not from an entertainment or a use or just a content generation point of view, but here yeah, that's quite critical in terms of like defining what is citizenship and how do we all participate in this area of citizenship. So, and I think it's being done, but what is the challenge is how to translate this into an existing 
metric and logic and understanding of what multi-stakeholder is. And actually, it is this kind of existing logic and imagination that needs to shift to be able to allow for new kinds of thinking and models to come up. How? Maybe we need to shift the people who are speaking. Maybe we need to, you know, and I think actually, um, this is another thing that I heard recently. Um, which I really like, uh, the fact that IGF is such a great space because it doesn't, I know it gets critiqued that it's not a decision-making space, but it's the space in which um, debates that have to happen before decision takes place can happen. And I think this value of the IGF is this kind of space, it's actually quite critical and maybe we need to have like, you know, rooms that isn't like this, but like, you know, rooms that is much more, let's talk about how do we make this happen, how do we think about like, you know, really coming up with structures and ways of mechanisms that, that unbox this idea of multi-stakeholder. Listening to that and thinking about it, there is, when you enter into even a forum like IGF that is, you know, multi-stakeholder and has this idea of dialogue, there's, there's so much of the accoutrement of the United Nations system, the formalities and deference to governments and the way speeches are laid out, it's still structured in a way that's the old style system that acts as a constraint on, on participation for a lot of people from the get go, right? Did either of you want to remark on those comments? And the how? The how is really good. Yeah. Yes, the how is actually what we're trying to define now. I can speak only of the Arab region. Obviously, I said earlier that we need to be very tactical in engaging with governments because without them, we, can, we can't go anywhere. And you just said that. I mean, we, we are not trying to paint a black picture of how you know, the online environment is being shaped at the moment with, in, in the Arab region when it comes to the youth. I know that there is a kind of many, many emerging um, uh, blogger communities that are hands on when it comes to reporting about you know, issues that are directly related to socioeconomic problems in the Arab region and so on, but that's a minority. I mean, we're trying to, to, to target the grassroots, and that's. Uh, that's happening at a much more larger scale. Now, how to engage with governments probably to feed into the, uh, to the question of the sentiment is, is literally you will have to be in a position to sit down you know, with them on the same table to try to convince them that this is important. But, you know, uh, from, from my interaction with governments which is from the Arab region, uh, there is a kind of complete closure when it comes to open up to any kind of innovative idea that will, you know, foster a change in the mentality, in the mindset. It's an issue with the mentality. And sometimes the conversation can lead to uh, a counter kind of uh, solution or it, it counter effect, it backfires. And it happened in Jordan. In Jordan, when civil society tried to speak with, with you know, the government about, you know, banning on online websites and the result was, you know, shutting down other uh, knowledge websites like Heber, for example. The result, that's the result of actually a, of a conversation with a government official. So, you know, engaging with governments does not always result, you know, in positive uh, results in the Arab region. So I'd love to pass to maybe... Because um, we're going to give it a one more time with the video, but I'll let you guys uh, succinct this part. Very quickly to the comments one by one. The political participation online the Arab world is not as deep. Yes, I agree. I mean, the thing is that we always have to raise the bar. Okay, so we constantly need to point that we need more. The open approach of the Western based or North North based uh, organization needs to be as transparent and open, and that's a message to those organizations. So I think you conveyed a very strong message, and I agree. CTTLDs of islands that need to be addressed. This is a forum for it, the IGF. So these issues can be pressed here. So it's important that this is kept in the script and so people can know. And finally, the next billion and concerning the authoritarian regimes where they are come from, uh, they come from, basically the internet is the, a catalyst for change. So bring it over there and then begin to see change happening in those countries as well. It will accelerate it. So that's where I'd like to have it. Okay, so we go, we're going to go over the video queue. You see, I've, I want you all to do what I do. I have made a paper airplane. So if this doesn't work, we're all going to throw paper airplanes at you, okay? All right, one last chance. So, so two things. First, is this the video we we're going to show? At the I'm, I'm, I'm arming it, Robert. We got, go.
I think we're at a watershed moment for cyberspace. If you fast forward like 50 years down the road, future historians would look back and go, you know, there was that time in the 1990s and 2000s when citizens of the Earth built this open distributed network and everyone could communicate with each other freely, and then it all shut down through censorship, surveillance, and militarization. We live in a surveillance state. Increasingly, consumers are using services provided them for free, and that business model has unintended side effects of facilitating easy, cheap, wholesale surveillance. Both law enforcement folks, as well as military folks, say you might be part of a terror network, therefore everything has to be monitored. I see a real danger of the state casting itself in the role of protector and being seen as the enemy of the people. It looks like we have two sides. So there's a side of governments that support openness, and the other side is governments where they have black boxes. The approach to digital security has to be comprehensive, and we have to empower citizens, as opposed to what some of these authoritarian regimes are trying to do, which is to disempower people and to not allow them to have control over their own lives and the tools in their hands. We have to defend freedom of expression. Freedom of expression goes hand in hand with privacy. And I believe that freedom of internet is the biggest contribution to peace in the world. I work with a group of people in Morocco who were targeted by a software called Da Vinci. The number of The digital arms trade is big business, and that means it won't stop. What used to be our global commons of information has become ground zero for intelligence agencies and military organizations around the world. If one side says, I'm building a national internet, from which I can attack people. The rest of the world doesn't really have a choice. We are going to have to fight this out on a national basis. National security is important, but it's problematic when governments re-engineer a resource that the whole world uses for communication and for organization. I think you're all running out of time because the next really unpleasant event will cause people like me to pay a great deal more attention to the issue of cyber controls and no one will like the results. I think the future of cyberspace is not going to be determined by those of us living in Toronto or New York or even Silicon Valley, but by the next billion digital natives coming online from the global south. If we care about keeping cyberspace open and secure, we have to engage in a global dialogue. So, so that's one video, and now we have a second video that's it, the work of kind of engaging and talking to users in India that um, colleague uh, Blair there uh, has produced. So we'll show it right away, so then we can get a little bit of maybe comment afterwards and reaction. anonymity that you could be anyone you could like the famous line is anyone can, you know everyone is a dog on the internet or anyone can be a dog on the internet or someone is a dog on the internet um, but basically that idea of that uh, actually to be very honest uh, Indians are quite clueless about how much personal data is being collected and in how many forms because many of these forms are now being done in a manner which seems very innocuous but all the data in the end is ending up with one single repository, which is the government. So therefore there are huge issues here which Indians are mostly unaware. 
I'm, I'm always struck by when if you're tapping on our phones, how do you not have the information you need to address issues like taxes, to address issues of, of corruption and dishonesty, uh, a decision making that is extremely flawed by uh, persons, you know, by elites in positions of power. It's very important for users to learn how to protect themselves online. It's the same as uh, if you go out into the world, you also need to know if you're going to cross the road, you need to know that you better look left and right before you do that to see if there's any cars coming. It's the same way when you're on the internet. When you're communicating online, then I think users need to understand how to make themselves more secure. And I think that's a really important aspect. Like once the user education is there, it actually takes care of a lot of other issues. But if the user education is not there, that basically means you have given away all your rights on the of communication to somebody that you trust. And would you like other site or software or whatever? It's up to you. But if you don't have an understanding of what that requires, there's no way to actually learn about it. The cyber law uh, is a new phenomenon. And it needs more uh, discussion among all interest groups. And formulate a mechanism is very important so that one interest group does not dominate uh, either the law or the impact of it. You know. If you look at the web of laws that exist that can be used in a way to kind of curb uh, various aspects of freedom on, online, you're really talking about a really intricate network. Uh, the visible ones of these are things like the Information Technology Act, etc. But you also have a wide range of laws whose kind of application cannot even be anticipated. You know, so I think in that, in that way, yes, it's impossible to talk about cybersecurity without simultaneously discussing it as a legal issue. Any comments or questions? Uh, maybe just quickly to, to give a quick overview of what you've just seen. Uh, it's a, you know, a short trailer of a feature-length documentary on cybersecurity in India. But we're approaching it from the uh, civil society perspective. Uh, government and enterprise have their own PR teams, and uh, we have very few, so we're hoping to tell a, uh, a somewhat unique story, and a story that needs to be told more. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Fuzian Zaid. I'm with the Freedom House delegation. I'm from Morocco, and I teach at Al-Khamid University. I just in response to the gentleman here about the question, and we saw in the, the, the documentary. Now, um, we need a model of what this internet is. Now, the, I mean, the first few billions are using it. I don't think they have figured it out yet. Like, if I can make an argument about print media, for example, broadcasting, and there are existing models out there that say, for instance, First Amendment, print media should not be regulated, uh, issue of public sphere, broadcasting, we have public service as a model, the principle is there. Now, with the internet, we don't know. I mean, the West, Western countries have not yet developed like an idea of what this is, how it can be regulated. It's going to be regulated like print, like broadcasting, or it's going to be something else. Now, with I mean, things got complicated with, with Snowden, of course, revelations and everything. But these issues here of national security, child pornography, privacy issues, copyrights, intellectual property, all of these, I mean, I think we need to, to figure that out at some moment and just decide on how do we want to deal with this piece, you know, how do we want to deal with the internet. And without this normative model, it's very hard for us in the, in the South to really make any, any progress, you know, because we need some normative standards out there that say this is what the internet ought to be, um, you know, some articulation of that, you know. It's something that I, I've been here walking around in this Forum. I haven't seen that yet. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that. So, am I right that we are we've reached the end? Uh, I want to first of all thank all of you for coming out and participating here in, in this uh, dialogue. And uh, secondly, I want you to join me in thanking uh, the panelists here who gave some really insightful uh, commentary on, on the topic.
topics uh, that we came here to discuss. So thank you very much, all of you.